everyone, this is Hannah from the Narrate team. This past weekend was the second part of Narrate's series, Baggage, a series on the dynamics of forgiveness. Josh talked about shame versus guilt. Enjoy! Hey, good morning, y'all. How's it going? It's good to see you. If we haven't met yet, my name is Josh, and I've been on staff here at Narrate for the past couple of years, um, but you're catching me toward the tail end. This is my second to last Sunday uh, as a staffer at Narrate, um, and this is also the last time I will be speaking, and so you'll only have to bear this pain for about 25, 30 more minutes, and then it's going to be over, okay? So just bear with me. Um, a couple of months ago, I was just having a conversation with Adam, and we were talking about what I would talk about this Sunday. And he asked me a great question. He just said, you know, what have you learned since being on staff at Narrate? And I've learned a host of things, um, but one particular thing that stands out is, and I've learned this from Narrate collectively as a whole and from a lot of you as individuals, I've learned, and I've got to work on it, how to not shame people. Narrate as far as I can, or narrate from what I've experienced, especially compared to other church contexts and so on, narrate is a community that is incredibly skilled at being a safe place for people to come to church, regardless of their background or what they believe in, and have conversations about Jesus that are helpful to them, again, regardless of what they come from. But then also just in sharing life with many of you and getting to know many of you and sharing some of my uh, better parts, but also some of my broken parts, and still that relationship remaining a safe relationship uh, has been another avenue for me to learn how to not shame people. And so that question, and just thinking about how to communicate that to you all, and then that coupled with meeting with a therapist on occasion, and I don't meet with her a lot, but when I do, I really put in the homework, you know, and just journal like crazy and so on. Um, I've been thinking a lot about shame that I've had to deal with in my own life and inability to trust people and stuff like that. And so really I'd like to talk today about shame versus guilt. And guilt is oftentimes held in a very negative light. And that makes sense. It can be used in a very negative way. It can be used in a very manipulative way. But I'd like to highlight some of the positive parts of guilt. And this isn't based upon me. This is based upon uh, remarkable and brilliant research, researchers that are much smarter and more educated than me. Um, but there are positive sides to guilt. Shame, on the other hand, is completely destructive. And this goes really well with this baggage series, which if you weren't here last week, we started this series this past week, and we're going to be going through it for the next several weeks um, and it's on forgiveness. And, if, and really the baggage term comes from, if you can't go through life without forgiving people, boy, that becomes heavy. And so the shame, guilt, forgiveness, and so on, I'd like to just jump into that series this morning. And I'd like to start us off by following the standard Josh formula, for better or for worse, uh, by a story. And hopefully that will kind of set us up for the rest of the morning. So a couple of months ago, I went to Walgreens, and I needed to get a few things, um, and the main thing that I was after were multivitamins, such an exciting life that I live. <laughs> and I went into the multivitamin aisle, and uh, I saw like big, bold type, bold font, uh, buy one, get one free on these really big bottles. You know, I look at the number of capsules in there. There's a lot. I'm like, yeah, I'm getting this. And so I grabbed those couple of bottles, and then I went to check out. There's a couple people in front of me. They checked out. There's a couple people behind me, too. Uh, and the lady rings me up, and I'm about to insert my card into the little chip reader, and she asks me, are you a member of the Walgreens Club? And I told her, no, I'm not. And she's like, well, would you like to become a member? And I said, no, I'd, I'd really rather not. Um, and she said, well, you have to become a member. I figured she had like some kind of like imaginary card, you know, imaginary person card where I could get the deal. She said, well, you have to become a member to get this buy one, get one deal. And I don't know if I was having a bad day or if I'm just a jerk in general, but I responded to her and, and you know, bear with me here. Uh, I responded to her with, can I buy anything anymore without having to be a member of a damn club? <laughs> 
And within half a second, I felt horrible for what I said. And so I started saying sorry. And this lady, she's elderly and very gentle. Uh, It kind of shook her a little bit too. Uh, And then she starts responding with, you know, I'm sorry. And I explained to her, listen, there's no reason for you to be sorry. I know you're not the one who's writing these rules. Um, You know, please, it's not your fault. And then she paused and she looked at me. She like was looking down this. She paused and looked straight at me and said, well, then your language is inappropriate. (laughs) (laughs) Gut punch, right? And so uh, I told her, I still don't want to become a member of the Walgreens Club. (laughs) And I'm going to find another place to get my vitamins at a fair price. Um, And then, you know, I profusely apologized a couple more times. And then she stopped again and she looked at me. She just was so powerful with the way she composed herself in this moment. She said, it's okay. You seem like a nice person. You just made a mistake. Gut punch number two, right? (laughs) And so I got in my truck and drove home and laid down on my bed in the fetal position for a couple of hours. (laughs) Now, a few observations from that story. First off, that woman, she saw me. You know, I don't make a habit of getting upset about extremely minor things like that. But I also have my broken parts, and I don't often show those broken parts with people. I'm I'm, I'm skilled at putting up some form of a facade, so they only see the good parts of me, thinking that that's going to help my relationships, when in all reality, that doesn't help me. But in that moment, for those few seconds, that woman was able to see me, right? The good parts, the part that felt bad, the profuse apology, and then also the broken parts. They got upset about something that was really nothing, right? On top of that, she didn't just brush it under the carpet. Like, she identified what I had done wrong with the, you know, then your language is inappropriate. She identified what I had done wrong in that moment. But then within a few seconds, she looked at me and said, but it's okay. And you seem like a nice person. You just made a mistake. She identified my guilt, but she didn't try to shame me into explaining that guilt, that mistake with this is who you are and this is who you always will be. I know that's a minor interaction, but boy, I learned a lot from it. There's one communicator. Her name is Brene Brown. She's a researcher, and she researches shame and vulnerability and guilt and so on. And she uh, gave a TED Talk called The Power of Vulnerability. It's one of the most listened to TED Talks in uh, the history of TED Talks, and she's given several more. Uh, In one of her particular talks is called Listening to Shame. She talks about that dynamic between shame versus guilt. And you know what? I feel like a Christian white girl that I like Brene Brown so much, but I'm just going to own it. I really like her. Um, But in this TED Talk, one part that she mentions about shame is she says this, that when you walk up to that arena, and what she means by that is when you walk into that arena of vulnerability in, in a relationship, in a workplace, public speaking, whatever have you, whenever you walk up to that arena and you think, I'm going in, I'm going to try this. Shame is the gremlin that says, "Uh uh-uh, you're not good enough. Shame is the part of you that holds you back from expressing how you truly feel, who you truly are. It's the part of you that holds you back from expressing uh, your good parts, but even harder to do so to express your broken parts of you as well. She goes on by mentioning guilt and contrasting guilt with shame. She says this, that the thing to understand about shame is it's not guilt. Shame is a focus on self. Guilt is a focus on behavior. Shame is I am bad. Guilt is I did something bad. Shame is this is who you are. Guilt is this is a mistake, but it does not have to define you. Now that leads us to the question, Neri. What are you ashamed of? What are you carrying around? What parts of you do you refuse to share with other people because you don't trust that if you shared that with these other people, that they would no longer be their friend, your friend, that they would no longer love you? 
that they would no longer trust you. Shame is, in terms of baggage, shame is incredibly heavy. And if we carry our broken parts and keep them to ourselves, it's remarkably unhelpful. Author Paul Young, and also a speaker, um, he wrote a book called The Shack, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, international bestseller, uh, very well liked by a multitude of people literally all over the world, uh, also American Christians, and so I imagine a lot of you know of it. He came here last November um, and, and because he's friends with Kate, and he spoke here for three gatherings, and he gave a different message at each of those gatherings, and the one message that particularly stood out to me was his 8.30 message, and I've saved it on my podcast stream, and you know, I've told Kate this before, but I'm going to confess this to you guys too, like, I really have nerded out on that message. Like, I've, I'm not exaggerating. I've probably listened to it 30 times since November, which is indicative that I don't have any friends. <laughs> or that I run all the time, and I listen to the same podcast every time I go on a run. But anyway, Paul Young talked a lot about shame in this 830 message. And he talked about the shack um, and what he meant by the metaphor of the shack. And he said this. That I use the metaphor of the shack, the house on the inside that we build. It's the broken heart, the broken soul. That little shack on the inside becomes the place where we hide all our addictions. We store up all our secrets. And it's a house of shame and pain held together by lies. And we never want another human being to ever find it. Because we're terrified that they will hate us if they find out the truth about ourselves. They will hate us the way that we do, and we just can't bear it. And so coming back to that question, what are you ashamed of? Shame says to you that you're too broken. You can't share that with anyone. Your your past is too wrecked. You're, You're unhealthy physically, emotionally. Your mom didn't listen to you. So what makes you think that these people are going to listen to you? That person left you whenever you shared with them that broken part of you. What makes you think that this person isn't going to leave you as well? Shame inhibits us from sharing necessary, what, we, what is necessary for us to do, sharing our broken parts, being vulnerable with other people. In the Gospels, Jesus has there's several stories in which Jesus eliminated shame and he met people exactly in their whatever moment of life they were in at that time and he eliminated shame from their lives he is incredibly skilled at this and one particular story that stands out to me and I'm sure that many of you have heard it is in John 8 and it goes like this John 8 starting in verse 2 At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery, and they made her stand before the group. Notice there isn't a man. Come on, guys. And said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. And so really, he's this hotshot, radical rabbi, um, and they're trying to hold him to a standard of a religious system that they had established and trying to catch him breaking that religious system, and therefore they could have a reason to accuse him and eventually kill him. And then it continues on. But Jesus sat bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. And when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And again he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. I used to watch this satirical show, um, and it talks about, or there's this one guy, and he, his neighbors are hyper religious. And this one guy, it's really hot in the summer months, and he stole. Uh, their air conditioner and from this religious family, and it's very obvious that he stole it. Like, there's, like, tracks. You know, he, did, he didn't clean it up at all. And then his neighbor comes over, hey, man, why'd you take my air conditioner? And then he responds to his religious neighbor with, 
well, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. And then he gets hit by a rock. And you hear a, dad in, uh, you hear a kid in the background, I got him, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. And Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, Go now and leave your life of sin. Now, I know that many of you are familiar with this story, but can we just make some observations again? This woman, in this moment, she is completely exposed, right? She's probably tried to share the best parts of her with people whom she shared life with. But in this moment, a very broken part of her was exposed in front of an extremely critical group of people. And not only that, she was full of shame for it. And, and, And in addition to that, she was having shame piled on her by the religious leaders who were accusing her in this, in this moment. So she is filled with shame, right? But then Jesus comes through and remains to be a safe person for her and says, I don't condemn you for it. And doesn't just brush whether she did it or not, doesn't just brush it under the carpet and by saying, you know, well, then go and leave your life of sin, identifying that there must have been some kind of brokenness that happened here. It doesn't just brush it on the carpet, I, identifies that, but then all, mentions to her that this doesn't have to define you. You can leave it. She was treated by the religious leaders and the teachers of the law, the Pharisees, as you are utterly hopeless. They were gearing up to murder her, right? You are helpless without a a hope of change. And Jesus says, no, no, no. I don't condemn you. Now go and leave this and become a more fulfilled, whole person. Can you imagine just experiencing that moment? And so it goes back to that question, what are you ashamed of? What are those parts of you that you dare not share because you're concerned that, boy, if I do, I'm going to lose that relationship. I'm going to lose that friendship. I'm going to lose closeness with this person. Their trust will be irreparable. One verse that stands out to me, and it's been one of my favorite verses in the Bible for probably 10 years is Romans 8, 1, and it says this, that therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Intellectually, I think, I'm not certain, but I think I can understand that. Just like, oh, yeah, yeah, there's no judgment. There's no condemnation. As Jesus communicated to this woman, I don't condemn you. But I think emotionally, with my heart, with my soul, it's been very difficult for me to embrace this, this verse. And, and it's not that I have that broken of a past. I really don't, comparatively speaking. But I just have a hard time emotionally embracing that there is no condemnation for me. Paul Young mentioned that in that 830 message. He said this, that we think that if they knew our shame, then what they're offering, kindness, goodness, Grace, forgiveness, affection, approval, they would withdraw. And we don't believe when we're offered the very things that would keep us alive. What could we do to start practicing eliminating shame from our lives and start believing not only with our mind, verses like Romans 8 1, that there is no condemnation, but also with our hearts? that there is truly no condemnation. Think about a time whenever you, whether intentionally or unintentionally, shared with someone a broken part of you and that relationship stayed intact and you knew that you were still loved through it. It's an incredible feeling, right? And it's, it's very helpful 
because you're getting out, you're sharing with someone something that maybe has been weighing you down for some time. But then the fact that that relationship stayed intact, the fact that someone loved you so much, valued you so much, that it, that it continues through that, wow, what a blessing. Now, what if we started to seek out people who we could share our whole selves with, not only our good parts, but also our broken parts as well? And what if in that we're embracing vulnerability and the power that is within it, the power that is necessary for growth and wholeness and fulfillment? And it's incredibly helpful. Brene Brown, she talked more about shame uh, in that message or in that TED talk, listening to shame. She said, Shame is highly, highly correlated with addiction and depression, violence, aggression, suicide, eating disorders. But guilt is inversely correlated with those things. The ability to hold something we've done up against who we want to be is adaptive. It's uncomfortable, for sure, but it's adaptive. What if you found those people in your lives who you could share your whole selves with, and it was incredibly helpful to your well-being? Guys, I'm moving down to Texas, and it's not for the 105-degree heat, you know? <laughs> and I am just going to miss the mountains. Like, I'm, I'm, that's going to be the, one of the hardest parts. But I'm moving down there because a lot of the therapy that I've been getting, um, the therapist has really said that it seems like you're dealing with some form of an attachment disorder. You have an extremely difficult time getting close to people, an extremely difficult time trusting people. And so what you need to experience is unconditional love, which I know my family has for me. And what you also need to do is exercise unconditional love toward other people. So whenever they make a mistake, whenever they share something they are ashamed of, they can trust that you still love them. And she's saying, I'm telling you, that will really be helpful as you work through this. What if you all did the same? You found those people who you could be yourselves with. You could experience unconditional love with and also give unconditional love toward. And then also, and, and in that, you know, giving unconditional love, what if you were that safe person for people? People can come and approach you and trust you and they can share whatever broken parts of them, themselves with you. But know that you're still going to love them you're still going to treat them with kindness and grace and forgiveness and goodness. As Paul Young said, things that we need to survive. This is what I've learned at Narrate. And y'all are just so many of you who I've gotten to have close relationships with. You're so skilled at it. And as a community, as a church community, and I've been a part of a few, whether that was growing up as a kid in Texas or, or up here or college in the Midwest or teaching in Asia or, or being back here again. I don't think there's a church community. No, I don't, I, I, it's not a think thing. I'm certain that there is not a church community that I've been a part of that is more skilled at not shaming people. And so thank you so much for that. Thanks for being a place in which people can come here regardless of how wrecked their past is, regardless of their marital or occupational status, regardless of their doubts and, and questions about faith and Jesus and Christianity and all of this, and it can remain to be a safe place for them. It's my hope that y'all will continue to be that way, and it's my hope for you as individuals that you can find someone who you can share your heart with, share your brokenness with, and trust that they're going to love you. And you can be that trustworthy person whom others can share their life and heart and brokenness with. And they can trust that you're still going to love them. As Nathan read earlier in that video in Romans 12, 18, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. I sure do love y'all. Could I pray?
God, thanks so much for um, the example we have in Jesus. Um, of someone who was so skilled at eliminating shame from people's lives. May we as individuals be that for other people. May narrate as a community be that for Helena. And God, may we also receive love from others despite whatever we might be ashamed of. God, we ask for that you would empower us to be vulnerable. You made us for closeness. You made us for vulnerability. It's crucial to our survival, to our growth. And so we ask for help in that too. I love Narrate. And God, we love you. Amen. If you would like to engage further with Narrate Church, you can find contact information online, www.narratechurch.org. We would love to hear from you.